You know, there's one thing that's true about every single one of us that's in this room this morning. Every single one of us has a mom. Every single one of us does. And so I hope that today, as we celebrate moms, as we talk about moms, as we love on moms, and everyone else that's in this room as well, that today would be a special day for you, whether you're a mom or not, even you guys out there. I hope today would be a special day for you, man, that people would just love on you. I know for me, when I think about my mom, and maybe some of the moms that are the most important in my life, the, the word love really comes to mind. And so I hope that this would just be a day where your family would just love each other just a little bit extra today. Uh, maybe if you haven't felt that in a long time, that maybe, maybe today you would just get it started, even in your family. Today is Mother's Day. Before I really get into the message, I, I want to start today by simply saying um, that I wouldn't be your pastor I wouldn't be a pastor without the encouragement of my mom many, many, many years ago. Uh, this is a picture of my mom actually at my brother's wedding. Uh, we're kind of in the back little dressing room right there. Uh, that is my proud, I am excited for my brother face as the best man, all right, right there. Uh, my mom has just been crying because that's what my mom does. My mom is a crier more than Pastor Rich, all right? She is a crier, all right? And my brother, I think he's been crying too, all right? We just, uh, our family, we cry, uh, part, part of it is we love each other, but part of it is um, it's just always a special thing when we have an opportunity to get together because we live far away from each other. My sister's in China and my brother's in, uh, my brother's in Oklahoma, my mom's in Oklahoma, and so, so it's always a special thing. And, and uh, I, I can guarantee you when I first started uh, out in this life, when I was just a little bit older than Everett and Hadley, all right, when I was about four years old, uh, my mom probably didn't think that I was going to be a pastor. I think she was probably just trying to keep me out of jail, all right? That was kind of her probably goal in life. Because when I was four years old, um, my, my sister and my mom tell a story on me uh, about how apparently I had done something wrong as a four-year-old, and apparently I was a crazy, heathen four-year-old. And I, I, I don't know what, exactly what I'd done, but I got in trouble for probably the 18th time or the 28th time that day. And so my mom, all right, she tells me she's, what she'd always told me, and this is kind of what she drilled into me. You know, moms drill things into us sometimes. She said, Reagan, do you think that's what Jesus would want you to do? And I looked back at her in her face, according to the story, I don't remember, but I looked back at her and I said, I said, I just get tired of pleasing Jesus all the time. And my mom says that about that time, my sister runs upstairs. She's a preteen, all right, like preteens do. They're a little, little dramatic, all right. They, they're, they're a little uh, uh, emotional sometimes, all right, a little up and down. So, so about that time, Alicia, my sister, she runs up to her room, and, and she uh, um, uh, apparently is crying on the bed. My mom comes in, and she is just booing. She is just sobbing. She's bawling on her bed. She's probably 12 years old or so at the time, maybe 11. And my mom comes in, and she starts comforting Alicia, like, what's going on now? Okay, I just had to deal with Reagan. Now what's going on with Alicia? Starts patting Alicia on the back. And Alicia, there, there. Now, can you tell me what's wrong, you know? She says, I just don't think Reagan's ever going to get saved. You guys, that's where my mom started with me. But in seventh grade, my mom is the one who encouraged me to start the first Bible study that I ever led. It was my mom who asked my pastor in 10th grade, if I could preach on a Sunday night, to which he said yes, to which she set up the video camera to make sure, you know, that it was captured in the back. It was my mom, who I am proud of to this day, for picking herself up out of life's gutter after divorce, who started life over again, and who has proved to me that even when life is hard and difficult, that God is still with you. Those are things that I've learned from my mom. I also would not be here today, you guys, without the mother of my children, and uh, this is probably my favorite picture right now with her, because this is our life, all right? And uh, um, only one of those ladies is my wife, my actual wife, all right? But those are her sisters and brother's kids, my sister-in-law, Brittany. Uh, some, a, lot, a lot of them are probably all here today. I think almost all of them are actually here today. And uh, you guys, this is how we live life when we go to the zoo. This is how we roll, all right, right here. That's how we roll with all those kids. And you guys, our life's a little crazy sometimes, but I, I just have to be honest, I wouldn't be here, and I want to tell you guys something about my wife this morning, I have to brag on her, we would not have a church this morning without Heather. And many of you guys know this, we wouldn't have a children's ministry without Heather. 
Churches don't run very well without children's ministries, let me just tell you that. You guys, on a regular Sunday morning, she wakes up, gets all the kids ready. I know she gave at least three out of four of them baths this morning. We won't tell you which one didn't have a bath. And she comes in here, and she typically, if she's leading kids' church or helping get that going, she runs over there. She gets that going. She comes to this piano. She practices with us from about 8.45 to 9.40-ish for this morning till almost 10, till it's time to start. Then she goes a lot of times and helps get kids' stuff ready again, make sure everybody's showing up for all the classes. And then she comes back here and plays again. And a lot of times, at least one, one month out of three, then she's going back to kids' church. And that's what she does and what she's done for a year and a half. And I'm thankful to be her husband today. I'm blessed as well, you guys, this morning. I started thinking about moms. Um, to have two grandmothers who love Jesus and two grandmothers who got better with age. One of my grandmothers has passed away. My other grandmother, Mary Lee Wagner, is still living. This is a picture of Mary Lee Wagner to this day. We always joke about her that if you call her on the telephone, all right, you're gonna, she's going to pick it up. She's going to say, Wagner's residence, this is Mary Lee speaking, you know, kind of the old way that she would do that. If you called my grandfather who has passed away, if you called my grandfather back in the day, he would pick up the phone and say, Wagner's, just like that right there. Totally two different people, but both love Jesus. My grandmother loved Jesus. And I'm praying for her. I'm actually going to go see her this week uh, because uh, after living in the same home for the last few decades, uh, she started having uh, some balance issues with her equilibrium. She's now in her mid-90s. Looks pretty good for mid-90s, doesn't she? But she finally had to go into an into a assisted living center, which she, uh, she calls her room now her minuscule apartment, and that's what she calls it. Still has all of her wits about her. This week, Presley and I, we're going to hop on a plane and go visit her and go cheer her up in her minuscule apartment, as she calls it. Today, I hope that all of you, the same way I'm just kind of running through my moms this morning, I, I could talk about Kelly, I could talk about my grandma Vita, I could talk about other people, but I hope all of us, whether man or woman in this room, recognize where we would be or maybe where we wouldn't be without others in our lives to help us get there. Where you are even today because of those God has placed in your life as well. If you would, turn in your Bibles with me this morning to Judges 4. We're going to look at a female judge today named Deborah. And we're going to look at a nation that once again struggled following Jesus, following God. But in this case, there was a woman named Deborah backed by a man named, we're going to call him Barak, all right? Because uh, I used to call it Barak in the day, but now we've had a president Close to this, so I think Barak is what we're going to call this guy today. And we're going to look at this today uh, because, you guys, I believe that Deborah was a very, very important mother in the Bible. And, uh, and we're going to see that. And, and just a little bit of background of this story before we start getting into it, before we start reading the verses, before we start checking it out. Deborah, all right, she was a judge, all right? And she was a leader at this time. And so here's one of the things that I want to tell all the women in the room this morning is this. Ladies, don't let anybody ever tell you that you can't be a leader. Don't let any church ever tell you that you can't be a leader. But also, that's, all, that's one side of the pendulum. But on the other side, don't let anybody ever tell you that because you're a leader, that you don't also have to respect men, husbands, and pastors. It's kind of a balance, isn't it? You know, um, if you want respect, you have to earn respect. And so I think that's true for women. I think that's true for men as well. But Deborah, she definitely was a leader at this time in history. Barak, he was the leader of a tribe of Naphtali. Naphtali, they were the fighters. They were the, they were the, the biggest men of Israel, all right? These were the guys that you wanted going in front of you in the battle, all right? And these guys would a lot of times lead Israel into battle. And so Barak, he was the leader of the tribe of, of Naphtali. So he was probably like the biggest of the big guys, all right? He was like the top, you know, top-notch, all right, black ops marine type guy for our day and time, all right? This guy was, he was the warrior. And then you have a person named J.L., all right? J.L. reminds me for some reason, uh, what's the lady's name in Superman? Uh, uh, there's like his mom, what is it? Not Lois, what is it? Someone? What, yeah, someone say it again. 
Oh, Jor-El. Yeah, it sounds like the name of Superman's dad. That's what I was going for. Thank you, Laura. All right, that was exactly what I was going for. But this isn't Jor-El. This is J-L, all right? And, um, all right, and J-L, we're going we're gonna, to, J-L is kind of the MacGyver of the story, all right? Uh, MacGyvet, I guess, all right? She is uh, oh, just a wife living in a tent with some milk, a blanket, a hammer, and a tent peg. And we'll see what she does with it here in just a little bit. All right, but J.L., all right? And then we have Sisera. And Sisera, he's the commander of the other big army that oppressed the Israelites. So those are your four kind of main people that you need to know today. And, uh, and we're going to look here starting in verse 1 of chapter 4. Before I do that, I just want to recap kind of where we're at, okay? So we have Samson, all right, we talked about last week. And I had several of you guys come up to me at the end of Samson and say that I left a story out, which I actually did leave a story out probably just for time's sake, but a lot of you guys came up to me and said, well, don't you think that God restored Samson? And I said, you know what? I, I, would, I would agree with that. God actually came one more time. If you heard the story last week, I don't have time to recap all of it. Samson made a lot of mistakes, and his life was kind of a tragedy, had a lot of things that happened to him that maybe necessarily didn't have to happen to him if he had stayed faithful to God. But what's awesome is God, just like he shows the Israelites that he's going to be faithful to them over and over and over again through the book of Judges. He shows Samson even one more time, really in his weakest moment, in his moment of capture, in his moment of blindness, in his moment of weakness without any strength. God restores his strength one more time and lets him really do the greatest thing that he did in his life, even after the tragedy had occurred. God always has more hope for us. So I wanted to mention that. But I, but I also wanted to mention this, that, that you guys, we, we talked two weeks ago about Ehud, all right? And that's kind of where we're going to start. We're going to start, Ehud has died, all right, in verse 1. That's what verse 1 says. You can follow along with me. It says this, that after Ehud's death, the Israelites again did evil in the Lord's sight. They were short-sighted. Their faithfulness did not last, which reminds me really, Because this story isn't about Ehud. These stories aren't about Samson. They're not really even about Deborah. They're really about God. They're really about his love and his hope, but also his desire for us to be faithful. So we learn some things about God, that God wants those things for us. But we also learn some things about us, I think, as we look at this. The first thing we learn, really, in in this very, very first verse is this, that our understanding is limited in this life. My understanding is limited I've talked to a lot of you guys and talked to a lot of people in the past, and one of the things that I've learned in talking to a lot of people is this, that most fights in the home, most fights in the church, most fights in any type of relationship whatsoever, a lot of times can be solved by simply stopping and talking to the person you're angry with and putting yourself in the other person's shoes. Say, well, you know, well, after 20 years or after 30 years, well, if you'd done that in the first place, it might not have gotten to 20 years or 30 years, right? I've learned that it's always a lot of times best to, to communicate first and to, to get multiple perspectives before you make big decisions in your life or before you write someone off in your life. In fact, I think that's how you, you keep a short list of enemies in this life, is by talking and communicating and realizing that what I think is limited because I haven't really asked the other person what they think yet. It's also, our understanding is limited. It's also, you know, why, you ask this question, why, why does somebody steal? Why does somebody commit a crime? Okay, that's dumb. Why would you go and do that? Why would you do something that you know is going to, man, get you thrown in jail? Why would you go and do something that you know that you're going to become addicted to? Why would you go and do those things? Why? Because our understanding is limited in this life. Why do people have sex before marriage? Why do people say things that tick people off? Because when you say something, a lot of times you can't get it back, and it goes out there, and then you start thinking, oh, man, if I, if I just would have known how she was going to respond, if I just would have known how he was going to respond, maybe I would have said this a little bit different. Our understanding is limited. If you think I'm wrong, just talk to your kids after. Uh, you Ask them for Mother's Day. Say this, where would you like to take mom for Mother's Day? I know that my kids recently, for her birthday, they said Chuck E. Cheese. Short-sighted, right? Their understanding is limited as to the best places. Understanding is limited. To experience joy, I think you have to understand two words that our society doesn't want to use most of the time, which is the words, you can't. You can't. We want to have this unlimited ability to do whatever it is that we want to do with our kids. We don't want to use those words, you can't. With our money, we don't want to use the words, you can't. With our God, a lot of times, we don't want to use the words, I can't. 
But God tells the people of God this once again. You can't be the people of God without being the people of God. You can't be the people of God without being a man of God. You can't be the people of God without being a woman of God and seeking after those things in your heart and in your life. And so we look at verse 2. Verse 2, we first see in verse 1 that the, our understanding is limited. That really just as people, we're limited by ourselves. Verse 2, we see some other things that are limited as well. So start with me in verse 2. It says this in our story. So the Lord turned them over to King Jabin of Hazor, a Canaanite king. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in, this is a tough one, but I'm just going to, I'm not even going to try that, lived in that place. Sisera, who had 900 iron chariots, ruthlessly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. And then the people of Israel, they cried out to the Lord for help. One of the things we at least see the Israelites do that's really, really good and that we have to do in our own lives is we've got to cry for help when we need cry for help. One, one of the things is, man, we, we, get, we become so desensitized in the society that we live in. A lot of times we won't even try to get help from other people until a lot of times it's too late. God's like 900 iron chariots. He probably looks at 900 iron chariots the same way that I would look at my favorite board game, Risk, the little chariots. You ever seen the little chariots in the board game, Risk? The little blue and little plastic pieces. God looks at 900 chariots like that. That's not a problem for him, but it was a problem for the Israelites, and they have no ability to overcome this army. Their ability is limited. They don't know what to do, so they cry to the Lord for help. The question for you this morning, have you ever cried? Because you simply didn't know what to do. That, that's the cry for help that the Israelites are, are crying. Have you ever tried to fix something and you, you tried to fix it and you tried to fix it and you ended up making it worse? Maybe a relationship. Maybe something with your kids. Happens all the time for middle schoolers, all right? They like different people, right? Hey, you want me to go talk to her for you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll go. I'll go fix it. I'll go. I'll go. I'll go figure out if she likes you, right? And then that guy comes back. What did she say? Well, I went and talked to her. She likes me, bro. You know, that's just that's kind of how it works, all right? And uh, I mean, two weeks later, maybe she'll like you. I don't know, but that that's just how it works a lot of times. Um, there's a guy in Greek mythology. His name was Prometheus. And he thought he could fix everything, if you, if you study the story, all right? Um, we don't talk about Greek mythology a lot on Sunday mornings. But this guy, Prometheus, he tried to do some interesting things. He tried to end human depression. All humans, all right, he thought were depressed because they knew they would die, so they lacked desire, lacked the ability to change their plight. And so he decided to do some things to try to help them. He decided to try to, um, to, to basically wipe clean, wipe the slate clean of, of them having any knowledge of the day of death that was coming for them. You... You will not even understand or comprehend what death is, all right? You'll just have a blind and intrinsic desire because of that to be more than you could possibly ever be, Prometheus thought, because I'm just going to wipe their brains clear of death, all right? Death is not going to happen. And then he also got this other great idea, and he's really more known for this idea. I'm going to create fire, and I'm going to give fire. I'm going to steal fire, actually, and I'm going to give it to the people. I'm going to give it to the people, not just the gods, whatever the fake gods, whatever. I'm going to give it to the people. So he says, I'm going to give them fire, and I'm not going to make them fearful of death. Right? Greek mythology, awesome sometimes at identifying the problem, terrible at identifying the solution. Does that sound like a good solution to you? Hey, here's fire. Don't worry about death. That's not, that's not a good thing. See, I think, the, I think Prometheus is a good example in this. The few of us understand a lot of times how our mistakes today will define the universe tomorrow. If you look at our, our culture, a lot of times we act like, there's no knowledge of a day of death. We act like we just want to have a blind, intrinsic desire to be more than we can possibly be. Individualism rules the day. But do we really make things better on our own, by ourselves? Here's a logo that's kind of an old logo now, but I wanted to throw it up there. All right, y'all remember that? The Internet, all right? It's going to change our lives. We're no longer going to have to call to get movie times. All right? You won't have to unfold a map anymore. It's going to be all right there at your fingertips. It seems like such a great thing. I've got access to everything that I need for my computer. Man creates this. The dark side of it, though, is there's a growth in pornography. There's a growth in shallow relationships. Facebook friends. All right? What does a friend even mean anymore? And, and a lot of those things have led to depression, to isolation. All right? As somebody, they invented cars. This is one of the, I guess, more later inventions of the car. 
all right? Not a real safe one, all right? But a very environmental one for sure, all right? Cars, all right? The good side, all right? Humans go, man, let's, let's make life better. Let's get places faster, right? Man, let's, let's make cars, all right? The dark side, people get smashed like pancakes when you create cars. Even food. Uh, this is not the, the best looking burger, all right, that I've ever seen. Some of the ones out at Wilson Farms you guys were making, those were way better looking burgers yesterday. Those were awesome at the block party that was over there. That is not a good looking burger. There's no cheese on it, number one. That's the first problem. But uh, you guys, food, all right, we, we think it's, you know, we can make more food. We can make it faster and faster and cheaper and cheaper. And yet that food a lot of times lacks the nutrients necessary to provide what we need. And so what you get as a side effect, the dark side is diabetes, even adult onset diabetes, shorter lives, more cancer, things like that because of things that we're supposed to make our life better. See, when we fix something on our own without God, we create a bigger problem. And I think that's what the Israelites at least realized. They didn't realize a lot, but they at least got the fact that they had to cry out to the Lord to help them out of the problem. You know, and, and I, I make these points because of this. I think one of the biggest problems that we have in the American family today is the American family is unwilling to reach out and get help from somebody else. I'm too busy for that. We don't have time to get together. We don't have time to heal our relationships. But if you don't heal your relationships, you're not going to get better by you trying to fix them on your own. Judges like Deborah were never meant to solve all of Israel's problems either. It wasn't about even just one person trying to solve all of these issues. God tells us this in Psalm 39, 5. He says, you've made my life no longer than the width of my hand. My entire life time is just a moment to you. At best, each of us is but a breath. Psalm 103, 15 says this, our days on earth are like grass, like wildflowers. We bloom and we die. And what is God telling us? He's trying to tell us our lives are short, yes. But I think what he's also trying to tell us is this, that marvelous are his works. We're fearfully and wonderfully made by him. He's the one who knit us together in our mother's womb. He's the one who can fix the problems in our life. We can't even go to one person that can fix it. We have got to include God in the solution. Last thing I wanted to show you guys is this. Look with me at verse 4. Verse 4 says this. So Deborah, the wife of, we got some great names, Lapidoth, all right? was a prophet, a prophet who was judging Israel at that time. She was a judge. She was a prophet. She's judging Israel at this time. She would sit under the palm of Deborah, I'm assuming named for her, between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites would go to her for judgment. And one day she sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, who lived in Kadesh in the land of Naphtali. She said to him, this is what the Lord of God of Israel has commanded you to do. Call out 10,000 warriors from the tribes of Naphtali and Zebulun at Mount Tabor, and I will call out Sisera, commander of Jabin's army, along with his chariots and warriors to the Kishon River. There I will give you victory over him. And we know here in just a second what Barak says, or Barak, however you want to say it. But one of the things that we see in him is this, that his scope of understanding his scope of ability, all of a sudden he feels threatened, and his scope in what he's able to see into the future is limited. And I think that's true for all of us. What we see, that I, I, can't, I don't know the future. I, I don't always have clarity about what's going to happen tomorrow. So what the most important thing is that I can do is to make sure that I live my life for God today. You know what, I, I, I could look into the past and I could say, well, because of the past, I'm going to do this. But what if God speaks into my life and tells me to do something different? We start thinking about the past. It, how, how many of you guys, I just want to do a show of hands. We may have done this once before, but I want to do it again. How many of you guys, you know the names of all your grandparents? Raise your hand. All right, congratulations. That's most of America. Keep your hands up. All right. If you know all the names of your great-grandparents, raise your hand. Still a few hands. If you know all the names of your great-great-parents, great-great-grandparents, raise your hand. Is there any hands still up? Just Daniels. Okay, I doubt that. So, yeah. <laughs> no hands in the room. No. Is there one hand in the room, great-great-grandparents? Jill might be able to. All right. It would take a while because you got a lot of those, so we won't do that right now. 
maybe one hand, and if we probably went great, 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 or even just one more great, the three greats, probably not, right? People, you guys, on, pre- on previous Mother's Days, Father's Days, that were very, very special to people, and yet for us, just a few, few people down in their lineage, we can't remember even their name. This is the culture we live in, but it's also, I think, true about humanity, that, that our scope is limited. We're here for a second, and our limited time here affects how we are able to see ourselves, how we are able to see others, but we're limited in time and scope. We simply cannot see everything that's at play right now, that God is doing right now, that's going on in our lives right now, that's going on in somebody else's mind about us right now. So because of that limited time and scope, it's easy for us to question God. If you live long enough, there's going to be a time when you're absolutely lost to what God is doing in your life. There's going to be moments where you just have absolutely no idea because you don't know the future, but you know who does hold the future. It's our God. And that, to me, is why we have to cling to him. And that, to me, is why we have to cry to him for help. That, to me, is why we have to trust Jesus. If you say, well, I've never been lost. Man I, man, I know what's going on in my life. I got this thing taken care of. If you've never been there before, that's probably because you're seven, all right? And so you've never actually had to, to go through anything very difficult yet, all right? But I know in this life, there's going to be times that we question things. There's going to be times that we wonder about what God is doing if we live long enough. We must understand then our need for God and our need for others because of our limitations. I'm going to finish with this today. This is the last thing, last verse, verse 8. Barak tells her this. He says, I will go, but only if you go with me. You're telling me that God's called me to lead a whole army, to go beat this other army of 900 chariots? You're telling me that, 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 that he's calling all these people out, all 10,000 of us to go? Man, a lot of us could die. Deborah, are you sure this is what we're supposed to do? We're supposed to go and we're supposed to fight Sisera? Are you serious? Sisera meant Sisera. He he, he kills everybody, man. We can't go, Deborah. We can't go do that. But then he tells her this, this big, huge, burly, rock-like type man, all right? Barak tells this woman, I will go, but only if you go with me. So Barak as Deborah go with him into battle. God allows them to beat a mighty army with 900 chariots. Sisera, the commander, he's on the run, and this is kind of the, the crazy part of the story because every story in Judges has a crazy part of the story. He goes and he hides in JL's tent, right? She's just a wife. She's hanging out in her tent, right? JL kills Sisera while he's sleeping with a tent peg and a hammer and kills the leader of this Amazing army. The whole army is defeated because Barak said this, I'll go, but only if you go with me. And you know, we give Barak, a lot of times theologians, they give Barak a hard time. Scripture says even, kind of gives him a hard time that he doesn't get any of the credit for the victory because of this phrase right here, that he's not willing to go into battle without a woman by his side. But here's, a, here's the thing that we have to remember. This story, again, it's not about him. It's about God and how he chooses sometimes to work in our lives. So let me ask you guys these very important questions this morning. Ladies that are in the room, what could your husband do if he knew that you were behind him? What kind of confidence could he have if he knew that he had your support? What could your kids do if they knew that you were behind them? 100%. My mom told me I could be the president of the United States. I don't know that I want to be all right, right now, but you know what? My mom told me that. She, she believed in me. What about you? Do you believe in your kids? Do they know that you're behind them, even when they're at their worst? I'm a church planner today because my mom told me I could do it. My grandmother, she, was, she, she actually wrote the first four-figure check to Grace Point. The first one that we received 
She was the first one to ride it. At 95 years old, she's still making a difference for God. She believed in me when there was no grace point. There was, there, there was, the grace point was like a thought in, in here, all right, that God had told us, hey, we, you should go plant this church, but maybe we'll call it Grace Point. We, we barely even had the name. There was nobody else who said they were going with us. My grandmother believed in me. See, there's power when two or three people get together. Y'all, y'all help me out. Y'all play, with, play here at the end of the, uh, the sermon here. Right? When I say Bert, what do you say? Ernie? When I say Batman, what do you say? I say Rocky Road. <laughs> I was going for Bullwinkle, but that's all right. Yeah. Jack, Jill, Bonnie, Romeo. Oh, this is a tougher one. Brad, Angelina. That, not, not, that one didn't work out quite as well, but here's the thing. You guys, this is why Scripture teaches us in the New Testament. This is why Scripture teaches us where two or three are gathered together in my name there I am with them. Man, when two or three people say, you know what, let's go do this together. When two or three people get together and they say, man, man, what could we accomplish for God? Man, God begins to move. I, I wonder how much you could accomplish for the Lord if you knew that somebody else supported you in doing it. I believe that God accomplishes a lot. But a few of us will gather together and say, you know what, this is what we together believe that God has called us to do. It's an amazing thing when God calls us to do something for him. I wonder if we would know who Joseph was without Mary, who Caleb was without Joshua, who Moses was without Aaron, who Timothy was without Paul, who Barak was in this story without Deborah. Judges 5 finishes, tells us this, that there were few people left in the villages of Israel before Deborah, but then Deborah arose as a mother for Israel. This morning, you know what I think it means to be a mother? To be somebody who will support somebody else to believe in somebody else. In each one of these cases that I just listed, God desired to raise up two people to do something great for him. So here's my question to you this morning is, who are the next two or three people that will do something great for the Lord together in this room? What's the next family that will say, man, God is calling us to do something with this family and with this family? We are limited, which is why God puts other people in our lives to help strengthen us, to believe in us, to go with us. Who out there in your life this morning on Mother's Day needs to know that you are for them this morning? More important than that, who needs to know that God is for them and not against them? Who in your life needs more of God in their life? And might even say to you, if you would just invite them, I will go. If you'll just go with me. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Ask my wife and Andy to come back up. I want to tell you something this morning. If there are people in your mind even right now that you're thinking about that are not here this morning, they're not people normally that come to church, but people you go, man, I... I'd love to support these people. Let me just tell you, if you're here today, you are the stronger of the two. And that may be scary to you. You may say, well, I'm, I'm limited in so many different ways. Man, my, my, my relationship with God is not where I want it to be even this morning. Well, let me just tell you, you may be the only thing, only person that has that other person on their heart. We have to remember today the power is found in Jesus Christ alone to change us and to change others, to help others come to know who Jesus is. I wonder this morning, who, whose life could begin to be changed if only you would be willing to go with them? 
only you would be able to, willing to reach out to them and maybe just support them. What change is being held back? What joy, what peace, what love is being held back because I haven't gone yet? I haven't reached out to that next person. I'm so thankful for our church. I'm so thankful yesterday. I think I got to be a part of three or four different groups of people that were reaching out, that were loving on people, that were doing bonfires, that were giving out burgers, that were doing birthday parties, that were celebrating with other people, that were including other people in their lives. Why? Because, man, we need that community. And I'm so proud of our church to get to go and be a part of all of that. If you're missing that this morning, we want you to know that we want to walk alongside with you. We want to be there for you. not just here on Sundays, but throughout your week. If you need something, we want to be available. Jesus, this morning I pray you just continue to put people on our hearts. And God, I want to thank you one last time for our moms. And Jesus, I pray that, Lord, you would encourage them, you would inspire them today to continue to support, to continue to love, to continue to be like you, Jesus in the ways that you've loved us selflessly, unconditionally. And I thank you, God, that in this room we have a lot of moms gathering together to support the cause of helping more and more people know the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus, thank you for the families that are represented here today. From the oldest to the youngest, we thank you for every single individual. We thank you for families. And we thank you, God, how you work through those. You work through our lives through them. Continue to show us, God, how we need them and how we need them.